The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work and how we can all do both better. I probably sound a little different today, and that's because I am coming to you from a phone booth at a client's office. I dropped the ball. You know, I forgot to bring my recording equipment on a trip and called my wonderful producer, Mary Dew, in a panic, and she said, we can do a voice memo. And rather than feeling bad about it, I'm just going to take some of my own advice and remind myself that we all make mistakes and that you all will forgive me if my intro doesn't sound as crisp and great as it normally does. On to the show. The topic of today is borderline personality disorder. And honestly, it's more about how to stop running away from your emotions. Our guest is Bryce Sito. He's a senior vice president of strategy and business development. He's a former actor. He's an MBA student. And he's been writing about his mental health and his diagnosis and how he manages his career as someone with BPD. What I think is really insightful from Bryce is how he learned to stop leaning in on chaos. <laughs> I really related to this. And settle and face his emotions and become a leader. I hope you enjoy the show. So I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder about seven years ago. And I'm going to butcher kind of the actual scientific definition, but I'll give you my definition. So it was a bit of a shock. And the way that I understood it in the beginning was just that people with BPD, basically we feel emotions a little bit differently than a regular person. And it's a little bit more intense. So that intensity of emotions causes kind of two typical responses. One is kind of like extreme reactions. So, you know, instead of feeling anger or irritation, we might go full into rage. Or the second is kind of, and I do this sometimes, which is like a disassociation. It's just like the feelings are too hard to deal with. And then you shut down, you know, our relationship with emotions is different than normal. And so I was diagnosed about seven years ago and I went through quite a journey with therapy. Mm. Uh, I was really lucky, actually. I got into a really good dialect behavioral therapy program, DBT, and, and I worked with some really amazing therapists. Mm -hmm. It was hard, but I was able to do that work. You know, I'm a little bit more senior in my role now. I've been back in school. Um, I'm doing an MBA. I've been uh, doing a lot more speaking. And I was like, you know what? I got to be... I'm going to be honest with my story and, and kind of really lean into that authenticity. So I realized from my own journey that there wasn't a lot of people like me that were talking about BPD. And the stats say that it's very underdiagnosed among men in particular. Mm -hmm. That was kind of my motivation. I felt like, you know, it's my story and I feel like it, I should start sharing it. So I started writing about it in April and that's kind of opened up so many opportunities I couldn't have ever imagined. So Bryce, I want to get into a little bit of your history and how you came to even get diagnosed. But first, tell us a little bit about your work life and why you're getting an MBA too. Yeah, work life. Wow. It's, 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 I kind of think of my work at this phase of my life as like a portfolio of stuff I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So like my day job, I'm an SVP at a company called Angus Reed. We're a consumer insights business. So I run sales and marketing mostly in that, in that kind of role, revenue, client acquisition, et cetera. And I've been in research or research adjacent roles for the last almost 10 years. Mm. And I'm doing an MBA mainly because it's interesting how when I started and I, and I applied to do an MBA, so I'm at the Ivy School of Business here just outside of Toronto. It's the top ranking um, business school here in Canada. Great business school. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have two little girls and I, I wanted to go back to school. So I'm a, I'm a college dropout. I never finished my undergrad. And I was able to kind of work right into business from there, working sales jobs and able, able to leverage that up into an executive role. I always wanted to go back to school. And then when I realized I could, you know, skip the GMAT and get right into an MBA program, 
based on my work experience, I kind of jumped at the opportunity. So that was part of it was just, you know, kind of like, I felt like I wanted to get a degree. I have daughters. I want to kind of show them like, hey, like it doesn't matter. You can still go to school and kind of lead by example in that respect. The other part is, you know, as I've gotten in, in kind of my career is growing, mm-hmm. I've wanted to work on some of those areas of weakness that I thought I had. So like for me in the business world, I felt like I was, you know, kind of fake it till you make it. And I was like, I don't really want to fake it anymore. It'd be good to kind of (laughs) know how to read a financial statement, right? Right. (laughs) So that's part of it was getting more proficient at Excel and and doing that. But it's interesting since I'm about halfway done my program. And what I'm learning is that it's not about, you know, strengthening your weaknesses. It's really doubling down on your strengths. And that's what I'm noticing. Say more about that. Like, what have you learned that you're strong at that that you're doubly down on? One thing I didn't expect in this program is we do a lot of like self-assessment work. So there's something called a 360 leadership assessment where you get a lot of your colleagues and, and people you report to and clients to do a survey about you as a leader. Whoa. And yeah, it's pretty intense. And you take all that data and kind of do a self-analysis on like, okay, so this is what I really need to work on. And this is what I think I need to work on. And we had to write that into like a 3000 word report. And that really resonated with me because I was able to kind of see not not just what I thought what my gaps were, but what people actually identified as my gaps. Mm -hmm. But I also was able to see kind of like with real strong clarity what my strengths are. And for me, and what's kind of coming out in this program is like, you know, I'm I'm a communicator, right? And that's why I wanted to, to write earlier this year. I started writing again. Public speaking is something I like to do. And like where I've kind of excelled in business is when I'm in the boardroom and I'm able to kind of like share stories and ideas, et cetera. And I was like, you know what, that's, that's a pretty good thing. Like that's a pretty big <laughs> part of business. And so that's kind of what I learned is let's keep leaning into that. And how do I continually get more practice and just kind of keep doubling down there. And then at least learning enough about the stuff I'm not as familiar with to know, like, you know, who to hire <laughs> to manage exactly. that. Right? I'm never going to be an accountant. I've accepted that, but I know how to hire a great one. Did you see your BPD reflected in any of the 360 feedback that you got? I did. Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the feedback that I received was, so I rank high on the passion scale. (laughs) And that's kind of a double-edged sword, right? So that comes out really well in a startup environment or if I'm pitching an idea or in the boardroom, I can like kind of get people to, to get excited and, and to, to take action. But on the other side of that is, you know, this inability to, you know, manage my emotions, so to speak. So it means like, if I don't agree with something, I might, you know, lash out in a way that isn't, you know, very good for my career (laughs) or just like, you know, not knowing how to like calm myself down and and just kind of manage my way through difficult times. So that's kind of the, the double edged sword. And that did come out in my feedback from, from, from a lot of people just saying like, Hey, I can be reactionary. I can, you know, be a little bit more uh, direct instead of managing the relationship. I might, you know, be too intense about making my point. You know, the, the borderline personality disorder is the big thing that I learned at DBT was the management of my emotions. Mm. Learning how to regulate and learning how to, you know, like de-stress tolerance and mindfulness, all of that. And when I was writing my report, it's amazing how I think it was a, a lot different than a lot of people's reports because I went really into, I was putting like DBT skills in there. And like I talked about my borderline personality disorder in my MBA leadership report. But when, when I think about BPD, it's not the thing that defines me. It's not also something I can ignore. It's just a part of the puzzle of who I am. And I have to bring it with me no matter where I am. And that's work. It's life. It's as a parent. Yeah. It's funny. I know that one of the prize leadership qualities is consistency, right? And indexing high on the passion scale is really great. But I wonder about this too with my mental profile. Do you worry that consistency is something that's hard for you to achieve as a leader and a boss in your emotions and your presence? Yeah, it is. It really is. And I think about, like, if you think about a business and kind of where I fit in best, I'm a really good launch guy. Mm. So start up, let's ideate, let's innovate, let's think of something, let's get it into market, let's iterate, let's fail. But I'm not a really good expansion or scaling guy. And I think the reason is because of that consistency. Like in the beginning, if you're just trying to make something happen, it's okay to kind of, you know, be a little sporadic and, and you're just trying a lot of things and seeing what sticks. And that's where I do well. If I'm managing a bigger team in a more stable organization and trying to get from like, you know, just trying to grow at a stable rate as opposed to exponentially, mm-hmm. it's tough for me. And this might be a product of my childhood or it could be a BPD thing, but I feel like I'm most comfortable in chaos. 
<laughs> that sounds like that resonated a bit. A little bit. Yeah. So I almost have to create a chaotic environment in order for me to be comfortable. I come from a very untraditional background. I didn't finish an undergrad. Like I dropped out my first semester of university. I just felt like this wasn't for me. None of my family went to school. So I just like, this isn't where I need to be. Mm. Got a bunch of random sales jobs, mostly like retail until I was able to leverage that into getting a, an office job as a, as a sales development rep at a tech company. And I remember every single day for like a year, just bouncing off the walls, wanting to get out of there. I had so much anxiety. I felt like a, a stray cat that somebody let, let in and was trying to domesticate. I was like, this is not for me. Oh my God. Just that structure, that nine yep, to five, yep. being in the office and the chit chat and the coffee. It was just like, oh, I, I don't like You mean I have to stay here all day? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's how I would feel. I would sit at my desk and be like, wait a minute, I can't leave. Yeah. <laughs> One hundred percent. I felt trapped. I felt like I was walking into prison every morning. It took me a long time to adapt to that. And I feel like a big part of that is like my own inner relationship with just needing to feel chaotic. I need to feel uneasy. I need to feel like I have to hunt for my food. Mm. Why did you drop out of college? Growing up, I always had this deep desire of like, I need to escape. And so I grew up in a small city in the middle of Canada, Saskatoon and Saskatchewan. So it's the, it's the big the rectangle right in the middle of the Canadian map if you ever have to draw it. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. If, you, if it ever comes up, you know exactly where it is now. <laughs> so right in the middle of the map in Canada where it's very cold and, and there's not a lot to do. And so I just kind of felt from the very beginning that I, I needed to get out of there. I mean, I grew up in the inner city. You know, we didn't have a lot growing up. It wasn't a very safe environment. I was around a lot of like, you know, schoolyard violence that was a little extreme that I just, I just had this feeling of, I need to figure out how I can leverage my way out of here. So I left, I left home around 17, got my own apartment, but I was also trying to do school because I was a good student. I just didn't really have any mentorship or guidance. I didn't know how to, how to do school. Like, you know what I mean? I didn't even know how to apply. I was just like, this is the thing you do. So I went to the school that was the University of Saskatchewan, which was in my city. And I, I think I felt the same way I felt there as I felt when I was first going into an office. Like I was in the big campus and university, none of my family went to university. And I was just like, this doesn't feel right to me. I, I felt like I didn't belong there, which was weird because I had the grades. I had the profile of what a student should be, but I just didn't like it. Hmm. And, and I had the feeling of like, this isn't going to get me where I want to go. And for that, I mean like money. It wasn't solving like the <laughs> financial insecurity part. Mm -hmm. felt like I was going more taking English and journalism classes. And I thought I was going to be a writer. But then I found, a, I found a job in sales. And I was like, this makes sense. This is like instant gratification. I do a good job. I get paid more money and I can use that money to get out of here. So that's what I did. I got a job selling cell phones at the little kiosk in, in the Costco in my hometown. And I used that to transfer my, my way all the way to Toronto. So I went from Saskatoon to a city called Edmonton, which is in the province next to it. And then I went from Edmonton to Toronto. And then when I was in Toronto, I was like, okay, I'm in the city now. And I was able to kind of navigate my way to, to getting a different job. So you went from selling cell phones at a kiosk in a mall, or sorry, in the Costco, to a managerial job. Yeah, when you put it that way. That's impressive. Like, how'd you do that? I mean, that, that's a really impressive thing to do. It's just kind of like a nature nurture thing. Like I feel like I did have whatever it is that makes a good salesperson, the ability to listen and present and talk. I, I had that. And when I started selling, it was pretty apparent quite quickly. I remember like my first month, I was already like breaking records in my district. And I, was, and I didn't know what I was doing, like in terms of I wasn't trying to compete or anything. I was just doing my job. And I was looking up. I was like, oh, wow, I won President's Club. That's cool. I remember I won President's Club at 18 years old. They flew me to <laughs> Vancouver. And I wasn't even legal to drink there, <laughs> which is... <it> was, <laughs> So everybody was going out. Nobody really knew how old I was. And I just had to be like, oh, yeah, I'm a little tired, guys. Go ahead. Have fun. <laughs> you lied about it. Yeah. The first time I was ever on a plane, actually, was to a President's Club work event. I never traveled by plane as a child. My vacations were like road trips in the minivan to, to the nearby lake, right? So I, I guess it was just this realization that, you know, I was, okay, I'm pretty good at this. And I was making money, enough money to kind of move across the country and, and have, you know, take care of myself. But that was a pretty tough transition, actually, getting out of like entry-level retail type sales. Mm -hmm. I was managing the store and managing a couple stores in my district at that point because of my success. And I was still only 19, 20 years old. But I knew I needed to kind of get into more of, quote unquote, an office job, mm -hmm. you know, a traditional business role. 
And it was just through networking. I met some people when I was selling phones that, you know, kind of took a liking to me. That got me a couple of interviews. I did one interview where the the VP really liked me and they brought me on in this. I had to take a step back. I, pretty much my money was cut in half when I first started into into a role, but I was at the age where I could do that. And I knew for whatever reason, I had the foresight at, at 22 to know that if I take this step back, it's going to lead to much better opportunities for the future. So I did that and I went to like a traditional, what you would call like an SDR type role where you're cold calling, trying to book meetings. And Whew. yeah, it was a bit of a grind, but from there, I was able after a year to build up a little portfolio of business. And then I spent a couple of years traveling across North America, typical account executive sales role, going to New York and San Francisco, LA, Vancouver, and pitching clients and building up my own portfolio of business. So that's how I spent my mid-20s. And then you got diagnosed with borderline personality disorder when you were about 26. So what happened? What was the process of that? There was something that happened at my company right around the same time where the division I was a part of was sold. So they sold half of the company, which and my division, which was more on the consulting side, got sold to a new a new company. And it just kind of changed this culture. And I was there for about three years. And, and I realized like, you know what, I don't think my future is here at this job. But at the same time, I didn't really know what I was going to do next because I was still, I had some experience now, but I was still this kid that didn't have a degree and I, I didn't really know what I was, I was up for. But something was telling me at the time, like, I got to get out of here. So I quit my job without anything lined up. And I had a friend who had an ad agency, so I went and helped him do some business development. I got into acting. Mm. I was doing a lot of improv comedy at the time. I really got into like the creative improv acting scene in Toronto. So I started, got an agent and was doing commercials and some some acting work. But when I quit, my mental health took a massive toll. Mm -hmm. And I did not expect that. I remember I was kind of waking up in the middle of the night with like dark thoughts and what I now know was like the first kind of signs of depression, just like dark clouds over me and just like negative thoughts and negative self-talk. So one morning I was with my partner at the time, who's who's now, you know, the mother of my children. We're still together. She was coming to the kitchen in the morning and I was like kind of slamming dishes around. I was just not having a good morning. <laughs> She's like, are you okay? And I was like, and I honestly told her, I was like, look, like I kind of just want to kill myself right now. Like that's how I'm feeling. And and she she looked at me and she's like, put on your shoes, let's go. And she took me directly to, in Toronto here, we have CAMH, which is the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, right to the crisis clinic at that mental hospital. And that was kind of like the start of me getting help for the first time in my life. A couple of things happened. One is I had somebody there that cared enough to take that step with me. And the second was I just had whatever urge to just be honest in that moment for the first time as to how I was really feeling. Mm -hmm. I didn't say it to manipulate. I didn't say it to exaggerate. I just said it because that's how I felt. And she saw that. And that was kind of like my first, okay, so if I open up and I talk about how I'm feeling, no matter how scary or, or you know, how intense it might be, like that is your first step towards getting better. Did you have warning signs though? Yeah, it wasn't zero to 100. Like over time, my mental health, I guess my depression got more and more intense and, and it became more and more unbearable. But nothing that I, I would have been able to pick up on. It's always kind of subtle. And now I know how to look for those signs. Like if I know if, if, if I'm kind of in a dark place, it might be like things that used to interest me aren't interesting me as much anymore. I might be more fatigued. Like I, I'm kind of have that, that awareness through seven years of therapy. But at the time, there was nothing that I would have known to pick up on. It was just whatever reason that morning, it was just like this intense thought of feeling of like, I, I just, I don't want to be here. I, I realized too how much how important work was for me after I kind of left it. That structure that I talked about being hard for me to adapt to almost ended up being a crutch because it gave me purpose. It gave me structure. You know, I tie a lot of my own self-worth into my work. And like I said, I was traveling a lot. I was very busy and I was able to kind of hide, you know, any kind of thing that I was feeling behind the fact that, oh, I'm just busy. You know, I, I can just dive into my work. And I've been able to do that. I was able to do that most of my life. Like even when I left home, I left home because I wasn't really doing well. And I know that now. I wasn't happy in my environment. I had a lot of trouble with relationships, like friendships and relationships even with my family. There was just like, nothing really felt good about home. But I was able to disguise me leaving as like ambition, like I'm going to go after something, right? When in reality, I think a lot of it was me just running away and not wanting to deal with it. And so when I left my job, I didn't have that, kind of like invisibility cloak anymore. I didn't have that, you know, that, that crutch that I could fall back on, which is just busy, 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 let's work. And it was just kind of like me, <laughs> you know, you know, it's just me and my time. And I was just like, I, 
it was a lot. It's like everything kind of like, I was just kind of like standing there naked having to deal with myself. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing. New currencies come and go. Decades of savings lost in days. All showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise. A promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. A promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. What do you think the clue was that the doctors knew that it was BPD? I asked myself that question a lot, actually. So I went into the crisis clinic. I talked to, I guess, kind of like their crisis social worker person who was amazing. Yeah. I kind of told her about how I was feeling. I was very honest with her. You know, I, I think that's a big step in towards getting help. And I didn't know at the time, I guess at that point, I felt like I had nothing to lose. So I'm like, look, this lady sitting here, she's listening. She seems to want to help me. So here it is. <laughs> and so, so I kind of dumped it all out. And I think a lot of the, the signs for her when she was evaluating was things like, you know, kind of like impulsive behavior. So like acting on emotion, you know, kind of that didn't really make sense to, how extreme the event was. So I told her about like how I was having a lot of fights with my partner mm -hmm. and I was like kind of acting like really enraged and like angry and just not able to manage that anger. I talked about like, just like these cravings I had for like using substances and I wasn't really using, but I just intensely wanted to. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the past I have, like I felt like my early twenties before I ever got help, I was just looking for any reason to escape. So a lot of that was work, like I said, but sometimes it would be just like going out all night and just finding any substances that would keep me away from having to deal with myself. I told her that like that was an urge that was coming back. And then she brought in a, a psychiatrist to do like an official evaluation. And that was a lot more clinical. Like it was literally like asking questions, yes, no. You know, she, she met with me after he left. She's like, have you heard of, of borderline personality disorder? At the time, I never had. You know, to me, it was all bucketed in with all those other mental health dis disorders, like narcissism or, or uh, you know, any other, you know, ADHD. Like, I wouldn't know the difference. Like, I was like, okay, there's all these other disorders out there. I don't know what this means. So she gave me a pamphlet. She's like, hey, you know, I'm seeing some signs here. We're going to wait for the psychiatrist's evaluation. But here's, here's like a pamphlet, some information, some websites you can look at. And then I want you to come back in tomorrow. And we'll talk about, you know, the evaluation and, and go from there. So I went home. And by the way she was talking to me, you know, I could tell that she heavily suspected it. And I, I felt like, oh, my God, I have this disorder. And I had all these reading materials. So I went home and read it and I Googled. And if you Google borderline personality disorder, it's not a good time. <laughs> it's like it's 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 heavily stigmatized. And, and it makes sense. Like, you know, people with BPD are kind of known for causing a lot of damage and a lot of hurt in relationships. And and so you have like the survivors of of BPD loved ones. And a lot of it is like anyone you know with BPD, you just got to cut them off. <laughs> you got to never talk to them again. There's there's actually like therapists that won't work with people that have BPD. They refuse to because we're so volatile and, and emotional. And so I was reading a lot of that, which wasn't fun. And then the other thing is like, it's uncurable. I'm like, wow, I'm never going to get better. And so I, was I remember I was spiraling all night. I don't think I slept that night. But I remember going and on my way to kind of my follow-up appointment, I kind of felt this wave of relief. I'm like, I'm going into the crisis clinic at this mental hospital that's really well acclaimed and they seem to know what they're talking about. And maybe there's a path here. Maybe I can actually get help. You know, disheartening as it was at the same time, there was this feeling of like, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, I do have trouble in relationships. I do kind of, and I'm unable to regulate my emotions. So I was like, yes, yeah, okay, I, I probably have this thing. And so I went in and, and they told me pretty much on the spot, like, yeah, you have BPD, <laughs> you've been diagnosed. It was amazing at the time, though, here in Ontario and Canada, we had mental health coverage. And BPD was one of those things that I was fully covered. They put me right into the BPD program. They actually, there was like a two and a half year wait list and they accelerated me right to the top. They're like, you know, you can get you help right away. And they put me right to the top of the list. So I was able to go right into DBT. It was amazing. It's funny, Bryce, because you sound like you're such a mellow guy on the phone. It's really weird. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but to be told, like, I'm not a good person to have a relationship with, according to the internet, that must have felt terrible. It did. And I kind of went through a lot of my own 
analysis on okay so what does my life look like like am i just one of those people that's just going to be single and like mm. and like that's it and i just got to be this isolated person and maybe i'll just focus on my work and not on relationships and it's funny like when people think about bpd you know the assumption is that it's something that you're just vibrating with bpd all the time right <laughs> like you're just <laughs> unable to manage anything but for me, it's not like that. Like, you know, I kind of think of it as like functional BPD, whereas like I'm able mm -hmm. to have a job, I'm able to have a conversation with you and sound like a mellow guy, but it comes out when things are really important to me or when, when, mm. when stress is at an all-time high. Or like for me, it's in relationships. Like if I feel, you know, if I'm in love or if I feel loved or I feel that there's a lot of things that the intensity becomes a lot higher and then that's when it can kind of show itself. But yeah, my day to day, I feel like it can function quite well. <laughs> Are there triggers? Like I know for me, like I have clear triggers with bipolar. So like money, like money stress for me uh -huh. is probably much more likely to lead me to an episode. Are there certain triggers you've identified? Yeah, very similar to you. So money is the biggest one. <laughs> That is the one that I'll wake up in the middle of the night and have just like, I'll be ruminating and just my self-talk is negative. It's all the BPD stuff is just attacking me because of insecurity with money. And it's funny because I've had so much fluctuation and, and I've come from not much and I've been able to to kind of work my way through and, and have a good position and be in a decent place in life. And it still it doesn't matter where I'm at in life. It's just always, always there and lingering. And that's a big therapy thing for me that I'm still working through. So money's a big trigger. I think just this overall feeling of like abandonment, like or any, anything that kind of points to potentially being abandoned. It's it's funny because like a BPD thing or a thing that I do sometimes is I'll almost like self-sabotage relationships and then I'll be upset that I'm getting abandoned when I did it to myself. It's almost like that allows you to control. If you're able to control the fact that someone's going to leave, it's almost like more comforting than someone leaving on their own accord. But definitely like money, like money and abandonment would probably be the biggest too. You know, it's funny, a lot of what you're describing, I hate to say, sounds a lot like what we see as sort of stereotypical male anger. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned that it's harder or less diagnosed in men. Explain that. Yeah. So the stats say that men are less likely to have BPD than women. Hmm. But then there's also stats that say men are underdiagnosed when it comes to BPD. And it's hard to really know. But... I do think what you say about it kind of being what we think of just like male anger or even like toxic masculinity to an extent. Right. Relationship phobia, all that stuff. Exactly. That we sort of sadly accept. Yeah. I, I think, you know, there's there's probably a lot of traits in there related to some sort of disorder or, or mental health issue. But I think part of that issue is like it's very stigmatized for men to go and get help or ask for help or be perceived as weak, especially if that's not the environment that you come from. So my assumption, like if I'm, I'm if I were to critically think about it, I would say that like a lot of what we see as like toxic male traits, you know, could be just tied into like perhaps there's mental health issues there that are just not being dealt with because of the stigma and the barriers, whether they're put on by themselves or whether they're barriers in society for men to get help, I think are, are a big part of that. I know it was for me 100%. And I think that's part of why I want to be so open about it as, you know, a straight man who I, I couldn't find very many talking about openly about BPD. I mean, there's some people that say they have it like Pete Davidson says he has it, but there's not a lot of people actually talking about the experience and kind of what that means and so for me, that was part of why it was important for me to share my story. It's funny because you've mentioned feeling like a little bit of like what sounds like imposter feelings right around the fact that you didn't you didn't have a degree and you're in this managerial like role and growing and in, in this, you know, pretty impressive corporate career. Has that factored into your willingness to share your story openly or, or no? 100%. Huh. I feel like you kind of hit a point in life or I feel like I've hit a point where I, I can be more open and it's not all going to disappear overnight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I felt like when I was kind of coming up that if I was open about, even even open about my education, like I, I feel like I wasn't honest. The person that hired me knew and HR knew when I was hired without a degree and everybody else I worked with had one, but no, none of my colleagues did. And I was able to kind of like muddy my way around those conversations whenever they came up. And I just felt like it was something I had to hide 
because I felt like if people knew, I wouldn't be taken as seriously or it would all disappear overnight. And then you get to a point like where I'm at, where it's like, oh, I've accomplished all of this and, and there's nothing that anyone can say because I still have my accomplishments and my experience under my belt. So yeah, I don't have a degree, but I've also done all this. And, and so once I kind of got to that point, I was much more open about my educational background and kind of my own upbringing, my own story. And I felt much better about myself and about my work. I found that it had a pretty positive impact, actually, the more authentic I was leaning into exactly who I am. And like, yeah, like, it, it, you know, I never wanted to talk about my own upbringing. I never really shared about where I was from. Like, I'm from the middle of nowhere in Saskatchewan. And, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's not a story a lot of people could relate to, but it's my story. And when I started to share that, I felt more comfortable. I realized that I, I was creating more positive bonds. I was actually, you know, in, in the business world, I was resonating better with my clients. I was resonating better with my colleagues. And then it got to a point, I guess this year and doing my MBA and writing openly about my experience as a leader, but also weaving in my mental health into that. Once I did that first report and the world didn't end and I actually did really good on it. And I was like, oh, you know, maybe this is my story that I need to be telling. And so that's when I started to openly write about my own BPD and I started to talk about it at work and just share it. And I'm not like yelling it from the rooftops every chance I get, but if it comes up, if there's an opportunity to be like, hey, look, like I deal with this and you know, that's okay. And I've been sharing that. And honestly, it's, it's great. I feel a lot more comfortable, a lot more like myself, a lot less of that imposter syndrome because I'm fully me in, in those environments. And yeah, it's been very positive. I just think, I think what you said is really so important, especially in sales, you know, we connect to authentic people and that's really important in building relationships that create sales relationships. Mm -hmm. I find in, in business, uh, especially like sales roles or executive roles, there's so much posturing that happens. There's so much, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, if you, you can tell right away that they're just, they're just making up stories or it's not really true to themselves. And I guess I, I don't like that and I want it to be everything that that isn't. And yeah, sometimes that, that means, you know, being quite vulnerable in a professional setting. My last question is, what do you think colleagues and managers should know if they're working with someone who has BPD? It's a good question. I think one is, especially if you're a manager or you're an employer, to just ensure that you're doing everything you can to make sure that your employee has as much support as they need. With or without BPD, I think that should be just table stakes. But especially mm -hmm. with someone with an intense you know, disorder or who, who might need a little bit more work or more help, just kind of giving them that, that support. And if that means that your company is able to provide extra mental health services, that's great. Or it could be as simple as just like having a two-way dialogue as to, you know, if somebody needs an extra day or if they need um, some time to just give them that space. Because what I do know about BPD, and I've made a lot of friends with this disorder, doing a lot of group therapy and, and hanging out with people, is that there's a lot of people with BPD can offer as well. Like that passion, that emotion, that intensity. There's this feeling of like high empathy and wanting to do well for people people with BBD have, and, and that could be a major asset to any organization. So if you could find a way to like cultivate that and just showing that you're there and you're, you're there to support and you can validate, I think that's really important. And then if, if there's someone important to you and they've been open to you and honest about it, like take the time to, to actually educate yourself a little bit and understand what the disorder actually is. There's a lot of uh, stigma out there. There's a lot of assumptions people make because of what they've heard about BPD. And that's not entirely true. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot simpler than, you know, the, whatever they call it, the crazy ex-girlfriend disease or, or um, you know, the, yeah, there's a lot of really negative things out there. If you So don't Google it. Where should you go for good information? Well, I mentioned CAMH. They're great. I mean, it's more Canadian based, but they have a really good mm -hmm. resource for BPD. If you just Google that, there's also, I would look deeper into DBT, dialectic behavioral therapy, because that is the main treatment of BPD. So if you if you're able to kind of understand what that is, it, it gives you the skills and you know, kind of when I said educate yourself, like educating yourself on DBT, those skills are incredible to know when managing and, and dealing with people with BPD, whether that's a colleague or, or an employee or whether it's a loved one. These aren't like skills as in you have to learn something from scratch. I mean, we're talking about how to like distress tolerance and emotional regulation and, you know, interpersonal relationships. DBT skills should be taught to everyone, in my opinion. I, it's such I a, agree with this. 
the skills are so powerful, you know, just for being mindful when distress mm -hmm. happens and mm -hmm. we're activated. I agree that it is something that it should be taught in schools because they're really just life skills. Yeah. And I'm raising two small children and they're incredible skills for me to help teach back to them as to how they can manage their emotions. Because when you're under the age of five, every emotion is the biggest emotion you've ever felt in your life. <laughs> and I think it's important, you know, to learn at, at a young age how to regulate, how to be aware. And if I were to kind of distill all of it down to what all of this has taught me over like seven years of therapy and all the work that I've been doing, it's just this ability to be aware. And as someone with BPD, mm -hmm. you know, it's, 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 it's knowing that my emotions or my thoughts are not me. They're just something that's happening to me. And if I'm aware of those thoughts and those feelings, it allows me to then know how to manage them, right? So I'm stressed right now. I'm feeling angry right now. It doesn't mean you need to act on your anger and try to kill everything in front of you. It means that this is your feeling. Now you have a choice as to whether you want to act on that feeling or you want to regulate your way through that feeling so that you can have a more productive conversation or a more productive environment with your surroundings than you would have had you have just impulsively acted on, on those emotions. So that awareness is so key for me because that's the first step is just understanding as to where am I at? And then, okay, this is where I'm at. Now I know what I need to do to deal with it. Oh, I love it. <sighs> Choosing to respond rather than just reacting. Bryce, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends. I would love you to leave a review because they really matter in helping the show get found. You could also follow us or subscribe. If you have a question for me or you want to submit an idea for the show, find me on LinkedIn where you can follow me, message me, I promise I'll write back, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the Anxious Achiever world. Thanks for listening.